And welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're here each and every week meeting interesting people and talking about topical issues. And this week we're going to learn about something that affects so many of us, and that is the stock market. Yes, there's an awful lot of uh, information, uh, communication, newspaper, TV press about the volatility of the stock market. One day it goes up 200 points, the next day it comes down 300 points. There's a billion shares traded in a single day. Uh, with all kinds of uh, crazy activity and one wonders what's going on. Why is this so uh, much different than what it's been in the past? And I think we're going to be uh, interested to know that perhaps it's not quite as different as we might think it is from what's gone on in the past. And we've got a real expert, uh, Brad Zerger from uh, Bank First, a senior investment anal analyst with uh, Bank First, is going to come and talk to us about uh, the volatility of the stock market, what's going on now, and what does that mean to the average Oklahoman. And we'll get to it right after this break. You're watching The Verdict with Mick Cornett, Kent Myers, and today's guest, Brad Zerger. Every day America uses clean burning natural gas instead of coal or oil is a day of victory for our environment. That's why Chesapeake chose to explore for natural gas exclusively, and we've never looked back. Because natural gas burns twice as clean as oil or coal, and reducing carbon emissions to combat potential global warming is every bit as urgent as cutting our dependence on energy imports. As America's number one driller of new gas wells, Chesapeake is moving fast to find untapped reserves of natural gas here at home. It's the right fuel for America's economy and the fuel for a clean air future. We just happen to be early to see it so clearly. Chesapeake, natural gas wins the day. Cox high-speed internet's already fast downloads, even faster. Get the switch, Johnson. This will blow people's minds. Introducing Power Boost, another thing you won't get from AT&T DSL. Lots of parents install alarm systems to protect their homes from prowlers. But how do you protect your kids from the predators who prowl the internet? Teach your kids not to talk to strangers online and never to share personal information. Monitor where they're going on the web. It's not nosy, it's good parenting. I'm proud to partner with Cox Communications to help safeguard our nation's children. To learn more, visit cox.com slash take charge. Our children are our crown jewels. Let's protect them. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Today, we're uh, very pleased to have Brad Zerger. Brad is the uh, Senior Vice President and Trust Investment Officer from Bank First, a stock market uh, analyst and specialist and a, an advice giver about such subjects. He graduated uh, magna cum laude with a, uh, a Bachelor's of Business Administration from Cameron University and has been taken in as one of the uh, outstanding young Cameron graduates into their organization recently. He is a chartered financial analyst as certified by that national organization. He's a member of Leadership Oklahoma. Uh, he is indeed someone who has studied uh, the stock market uh, forwards and backwards and knows a lot about it and I'm sure he will bring us a lot of good information. This is his first visit to the verdict. Brad, welcome. Well, thank you. Welcome to the show. I appreciate the invitation. 
Occasionally you'll run into a, a young person who is very, very interested in the financial world and, and stock market. Were you one of those kids growing up? Were you, were you reading the stock pages when you were in grade school? No, actually I wasn't. When I was in grade school, I had every intention of becoming a naval aviator um, and uh, pursued that for a while. A lot of ups and downs with that. A lot of ups and downs with that. Uh, <laughs> that didn't pan out, so I ended up at Cameron and uh, had the intent to uh, go into law school um, with an interest in corporate law took a uh, class in the principles of finance, um, taught by a great professor down there, Dr. Bhattacharya, and that tweaked my interest and, and turned me in another direction, and so here I've come, you know. So how does one study, from an academic standpoint, the stock market? Do you study its history? Do you study its future? Do you, do you, do you just read and, and study charts and analysis and, and cash flow? It seems like there's just so much information. Where do you start if you want to become an expert on the subject? Well, that's a good question, and you could probably fill a couple of shows just talking about that. But um, there are several principles that you know remain timeless as far as investing is concerned, and that's trying to find the right asset allocation for a given portfolio, um, making sure that you stay focused on what uh, your goals and objectives are. If you're a long-term investor, don't get caught up in what's happening in the last three months or the next six months, because there is a ton of information out there, and a lot of it's just noise. Um, but there are some. Uh, factors that you can look at when trying to value stocks like you mentioned discounting cash flows and looking at income uh, statements and balance sheets um, but really just some common sense principles of maintaining the proper diversification staying um, focused on your objectives and not getting caught up in the short term um, help, leads a lot of people to success I think well I guess uh, my, my wife has a sweatshirt that says on the front uh, the truly educated never graduate uh, that doesn't mean you stay in school forever, I don't think, but what it does mean is you're never through learning. I guess every day you've got studying to do, every day you've got updating to do, no matter what your base education might have been. Right, and that's actually one of the things that's great about what I get to do um, in the sense that you get formal training on it, but the, the market's dynamic. Um, it's changing from day to day and month to month. And then on top of that, your clients' lifestyles are changing. You know, they're um, needs and uh, what their objectives are for their portfolios, those change as, as their lives change as well. So it definitely is something that keeps you interested. It's never the same every day and, and I think it can keep you fresh and, and have a good career doing that. We, uh, we wanted to do this show and we kind of generally titled it Stock Market Volatility because that's what you read in the, in the headlines at least. If uh, I don't usually go be on those kinds of articles to go beyond the headlines uh, down into the article. but. Uh, there's a lot of uh, publicity out there that our stock markets are very volatile right now, and but in almost every such uh, headline or article, there's a reference to the subprime mortgage crisis. Can you step back from the stock market just a little bit and tell us what is meant by the subprime mortgage market crisis? Well, subprime home loans uh, are basically uh, mortgages that were made to people who have a sketchy credit history or maybe don't reach a certain level in terms of a credit score and can't get conventional financing. And so it's definitely at the heart of some of the volatility we've had recently, but um, as with most things, it's not a standalone event. It's you know, intertwined with other factors that go back several years. And the way I try to put it in perspective is uh, thinking back to where we've come from. In the late 90s, we had a technology uh, bubble in the stock market. Uh, was overvalued and the Fed stepped in and raised interest rates in order to kind of let the air out so to speak. Um, that led to a recession in the first part of this decade. On the back of that we had the terror attacks of 9-11. That was followed up by the corporate malfeasance issues, for, you know, if you remember Enron and WorldCom. And then we had a mutual fund scandal um, that involved late day trading and market timing. So it was a really compact window where we had a lot of bad news and it really shook investor confidence. So at that time um, a lot of measures were enacted in order to right the ship, so to speak. We had the Fed cut interest rates to the lowest they'd been in a generation. Uh, the Fed funds rate, which today is at five and a quarter, was cut all the way down to one percent. Um, Ten-year Treasury yields fell to a little over 3.1 percent in the middle of 2003, so it was a very low yield environment. Um, we had tax cuts and tax rebates that were enacted at the same time, and so uh, more money was put into consumers' pockets, and there really was an incentive to save it because interest rates were so low. Um, but that's what led to the real estate boom that we've experienced over the last several years um, and that pushed prices up. People that couldn't afford a home for whatever reason suddenly found that they could because of the financial, uh, you know, the financing costs were lower. Mm -hmm. um, those already in homes found that they could trade up and keep their mortgage payments Interest roughly the same. Interest rates were low, no yeah. question about it. Yeah. And so that drove demand for real estate, so prices went up, more so in some areas than others. Um, but as prices went up, 
these more exotic loan structures were used to get people into these higher priced homes, including adjustable rate mortgages. We all have seen the commercial for you know, interest only mortgages or mortgages with balloon payments. Um, and a group of those loans were made to people deemed subprime. Uh, and the problem is, as interest rates have now come back up, um, these mortgage rates are resetting and their incomes haven't gone up fast enough to keep up with that and so they're having a tough time making their mortgage payment. The more interesting thing for the people that kind of want to get down into the, the nitty gritty of it is another issue called securitization. So during this time, you had all these mortgage loans, they're pooled together into a security called a mortgage bond, um, which was then repackaged into uh, another security called a collateralized debt obligation and mixed in with some other loans and other interest earning assets. And while that's confusing, it gets a little bit worse where they then slice that collateralized debt obligation up into pieces or slices called tranches from the most conservative, highest quality piece all the way down to the riskiest piece um, with the idea that investors could buy whatever slice fit their risk appetite. Um, if you're a high quality in institution like an insurance company, you may want the highest rated slice. If you have a stronger stomach for risk, you might take the lower rated piece. Um, the idea is that it would spread risk throughout the financial system as opposed to keeping all these loans on the, you know, on the books of a few institutions. And it did do that. I mean, um, that's really been uh, credit to the economic growth that we've seen over the last couple of years. The problem is, as these subprime home owners um, have started to default at rates faster than originally thought, um, investors in these slices you know, have now found that they're holding an asset that's riskier than maybe they had originally thought or predicted. Uh, and they're not very liquid. They, they're not widely traded. So they're having a tough time selling these securities precisely at the moment when they want to sell them. And so it's really more of a liquidity um, event or a liquidity crunch, if you will, over the last several weeks that's caused the volatility in the market. But it's definitely tied back to the subprime issue. Um, but it's, you know, it's never just one thing. So Let me jump in and get mm -hmm. us to a break. Brad Zerger is a, an expert on the stock market. We're here to discuss why the market is so volatile if it is volatile. We'll get Brad's perspectives on that when the verdict continues right after this. Shining is taking responsibility. At Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Oklahoma, we know managing your health care can be overwhelming, and it's our job to help you meet the challenge. By guiding, supporting, and showing the way, we encourage you to gain control. Because we believe the best tool we can give you is the confidence to take charge. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oklahoma, shining through. That land next door was a mess. Take more than a lawnmower to revive that land. I heard the oil and natural gas people was cleaning up old oil sites, and it wouldn't cost us a blood nickel. Oh, yes, sir, it was quite a revival. The whole church showed up, want to make a playground for the kids. <laughs> it sure is a blessing. <laughs> we'll see Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma, working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. Wilsey, Meyer, Eatman, Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. A friend in the digital age is there when your daughter emails you pictures of your newborn grandchild. A friend in the digital age is there when you shed a tear during the last episode of your favorite TV show. A friend in the digital age is there when you stay up all night talking to your new love. For all the great moments you've had and will have, Cox is your friend in the digital age. Hi, this is James Garner. Hi, this is Reba McIntyre. Hi, this is Johnny Bench. Hi, I'm Barry Switzer. Hey, everybody, this is Vince Gill. Welcome to my home state of Oklahoma, where we'll be celebrating 100 years of statehood in 2007. Our strength is our people, and the 2,100 Oklahomans from the Cox Communications family are proud to be part of Oklahoma's story. Cox and Oklahoma, true partners. Happy birthday, Oklahoma.
Welcome back to The Verdict. We're talking with Brad Zerger of Bank First. He's a, an expert in the world of, of stocks and the stock market in general. We were discussing the subprime, subprime mortgage crisis and how that had affected the stock market. I guess I'm, I'm really confused to how the mortgage crisis could affect the blue chip stocks because there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect there. But if you read the news, it's got a direct relationship with the blue chips. How does that happen? Right, and that's a good question. How does a loan made in Orange County, California affect you know, some major publicly traded company? And the answer is there's probably several reasons, but uh, generally speaking, it's the market's just repricing risk. As volatility goes up, um, uh, investors' appetite for risk generally goes down. And so you see that uh, reflected across the markets, not just in the blue chips, but in smaller companies as so well. So investors get nervous, they pull their money out of the stock market and place it to something they believe to be more secure. Right, and kind of broadly speaking, that generally means treasury bills, treasury bonds, and so forth. It, um, you know, there's the quote unquote flight to quality uh, out of your riskier assets into more safe uh, liquid assets. So investors like confidence. They like, they like when things are going well and people are spending money and buying money and there's no problems around the world or the globe and, and, and everything just seems to be going well. Everybody wants to put money in the stock market. But throw anything to, to upset the apple cart, whether it's a subprime mortgage conference or uh, as a security issue on the other side of the world, and all of a sudden the money starts going into something they deem more safe. Right. That's definitely the case. And I think even uh, look, speaking more broadly, I mean, the economy's been slowing for a while now. It's growing below trend. Um, inflation's falling. I think there's some concern that with the housing recession that we're experiencing now that the consumer's not going to be able to spend as much as uh, perhaps they have in the past. And so the, you know, the market being a forward-looking machine, I think, is just pricing all of that in. But confidence is critical. Consumer confidence is critical. Yes. Uh, let's talk about something a little different. We've been uh, pitching this as a stock market volatility right. show. Uh, I want you to tell our uh, audience just in, in a little more uh, broader timeline just how much volatility are we really experiencing. And we have a graphic I'd like to ask to be pulled up. Uh, so that you can uh, kind of talk to it, if you will. It's like the New York City skyline. All right, and the, the chart's a little hard to read, and so I apologize for that, but what it shows um, is a simple measure of volatility going back into the early 30s. Um, there's a lot of different ways to define volatility, and by most all accounts, uh, it's definitely higher this year. Uh, but what this chart shows is the percentage of days that the S&P 500 has closed either higher or lower uh, by more than 1%. In a, uh, in a given calendar year. Those first <laughs> red lines on the left is 19, in the 1930s? Correct. So that would be during the Great Depression. So it was, it was a volatile time. Right. The okay. next spike is in the 70s? Correct. What, what is that? Uh, that's during the period of time where we had the oil embargo. OPEC, uh, OPEC uh, crisis. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, you can see in the late 90s, kind of scaling to the right, the group of red bars there, that would be um, kind of the tech bubble bursting and the uh, ensuing issues that we talked about earlier. Yeah, so tech, tech, tech boom and bust and 9-11 right, all working into that volatility. Now, and the red, it does not indicate a negative necessarily, it just indicates volatility. Right. That, uh, that, that the market went up and down a lot and in that era mostly down. Right, and, it, and so we're looking at it all relative to this year. So the blue line to the far right, that's so far uh, year to date, 2007, about 22 percent of the days have either closed higher or lower by a percent or more. So we're at kind of an average in volatility. Yep. You know, it could be that you know the media. You know, it's 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 not very interesting to talk about that uh, the stock market didn't do much today. But when there is a a big day on the stock market, whether it goes up or down a lot, then the media makes it a big story. And so it may seem like by by comparison that uh, that uh, it's happening all the time. When in fact, the only time you hear about it is when it does. Right. Yeah. The, if the Dow's down a little bit, you know, the word is tumbles or you know falls <laughs> or something. You know. It, well, and and if the Dow's at eight thousand and you have a 200-point swing, that's a fairly sizable percentage. Sure. If the Dow's at uh, 13,000 and you have a 200-point swing, it's not nearly as big a thing, although it's treated as though it is. Right, yeah, so a 200-point decline is definitely not what it used to be, but it still grabs headlines. If you looked at the chart um, that was on there, you, you would see that um, it is a little bit more volatile this year than we've seen in 2004, 5, and 6, but like you mentioned, it's uh, almost a return to normality in, in terms of taking a longer-term view at it. I'm going back into the 30s. You're an investment manager uh, of sorts for yeah. uh, Bank First. Right. Uh, tell me how, what you do in regard, in time periods like this, to give advice. I'm not asking for what advice you give, but sure. what do you do about advising your, uh, your clients? Well, the answer to that um, is pretty easy because the answer is it depends. It really does depend on what that particular client's 
goals and objectives are, what their needs for liquidity are, and so forth. So it does vary from client to client. But um, again, two principles that remain true um, are to have a proper asset allocation, make sure you have the right mix of stocks, bonds, cash, and real estate. Um, and if you are a long-term investor, don't get caught up in the short term. Um, an interesting, uh, I think, way to look at diversification and how it can work, um, the idea is that you're going to reduce your risk. And there are a lot of different ways to define risk, but one that we look at is the risk of loss. Um, we're all long-term investors, um, but when the market goes down, we become much more short-term focused. It's just human nature. Nobody uh, likes to lose money. Um, but if you looked at the S&P 500 over the last 30 years, the worst one-year period for the S&P 500 is a loss of about 27%. Um, if you looked at the Lehman Brothers Aggregate Bond Index, which is a, a proxy for bonds, over the same time period, the worst one-year loss is a loss of about 9%. So bonds are safer than stocks. That's kind of where the thought comes from. An interesting thing occurs, though, is you take a small amount of these risky stocks and you put it in that conservative bond portfolio, you actually reduce your overall portfolio's risk and you improve uh, return. During that same exact time period, if you'd had about 30% in stocks, uh, your worst one year would have been a loss of about four and a half, or about half that of the all bond portfolio. So during times of market volatility, it's important that you stay diversified um, uh, in, a, in a mix of assets that's consistent with what your objectives are. What, what in the world could, could, uh, could, could cause a problem in, uh, in the United States stock market? What, 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 what type of, of military action? What type of, of terrorism action? What type of economic impact? What, what are guys like you losing sleep over when you go to bed at night, wondering what's going to happen in the Middle East or somewhere else? Well, there's, you know, there's any number of different things to worry about. And one of the old sayings is that um, you know, the market climbs a wall of worry. There's always something to be worried mm -hmm. about. If we were sitting here three or four years ago and we were you know, saying, well, the outlook is for oil prices to double and um, inflation's going to go up, we're going to have this housing recession, and um, you know, we're going to have federal uh, you know, trade imbalance and uh, all these things going on, what do we invest in? You know, we probably wouldn't be too excited about stocks. Um, but yet, the stock market's done very well. So there's always something to worry about. Um, of course, a, a major terror attack, um, something that would um, affect um, economic activity here in the U.S. would be dramatic. Um, but how do you price that into the market? I mean, the Less than a minute to go. What about China, the Far East, and, uh, and their growing economy? How does that affect us? Well, the market's definitely much more global now. We're very intertwined with what goes on around the world. Um, they are growing very rapidly. I would expect that um, that would continue. We continue to favor international stocks, um, given our current outlook for the U.S. economy. Uh, but as the economy becomes more globally linked, you can see that there'll be a much more stronger relationship as to what goes on in the United States and in China as well. Um, the dollar has been going down in terms of strength relative to foreign currencies, so it should help our exports um, in terms of pricing. Um, so we might see a little bit of a trend, uh, change in the trend of the, um, the trade imbalance if that continues. But um, it's definitely interesting to see the globalization that's occurred. Brad Zerger was with Bank First. Thanks so much for coming on the show and helping Kent and myself, but also everyone at home who learned a little bit something today about the stock market and the volatility. Oh, well, thank you both. Thank I you. enjoyed it very Appreciate much. Appreciate you, Kent. Thanks. Kent and I will have a final word after this. comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Once again, the people have spoken. 
Once again, one name ranked highest for outstanding phone service. Once again, one company received a J.D. Power & Associates Award for overall customer satisfaction. And once again, it wasn't the old phone company. Cox Digital Telephone, the phone service people like most. Highest in residential telephone customer satisfaction in the Southwest region for the second year in a row. Are you the one looking for an exciting new career? If so, we are the one looking for you. We are Cox Communications, and we are searching for field service representatives. FSRs interact and perform services at our customers' home. Sound like the job for you? Then some of the things you need are a high school diploma and a good driving record. But for complete job description and qualification, go to jobs at cox.com. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're here wrapping up a show dealing with stock market volatility with Brad Zerger of Bank First. Yeah, Brad did just a marvelous job in making a pretty complex subject uh, understandable and in a short period of time. We didn't get to ask him near what we'd like to uh, and we'll have to have him back at a subsequent show to kind of follow up. But I guess the long and short of it is uh, the stock market in the historical perspective is not very volatile in, the, mm -hmm. in compared to what it's been in the past. Yeah, although it does appear that's to right. be. So if you've climbed out on that window ledge, come on back in. Yeah, come on in. Have some confidence. <laughs> that's right. We have a couple of websites for you to take a look at. If you'd like more information about Brad or you want to send him an email and ask him a question, I bet you can reach him through Bank First website. That's B-A-N-C-F-I-R-S-T dot com, bankfirst dot com. And, of course, we invite you to go to our website and give us an idea about a show that you'd like to see on a future edition of The Verdict. That website address is The Verdict. Dot TV. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next week right here on The Verdict. Proceeding program was produced by the Production Services Group at Cox Communications, exclusively for the Cox Channel.